Angela Glover Blackwell, founder and CEO of Policy Link, and welcome to America's Tomorrow, Equity in a Changing Nation. Today I'm talking with Ted Howard, the founding executive director of the Democracy Collaborative. Welcome, Ted. Thank you, Angela. Tell us what the Democracy Collaborative is doing in general. Why does it exist? We're a research and policy center that's really focused on uh, strengthening democratic life in communities. If you believe, as we do, that where democracy is built and strengthened is in the daily lives of people in their communities, that it's from there that democracy flows up nationally. We live in an age of, of mobile jobs and capital, um, our companies being exported, people losing their, their work, um, generational poverty, 20, 30, 40 percent in some cities. And when you have your underpinnings economically ripped out from under you, it becomes very difficult to have a thriving democratic life. I've been following your work for some time and have really connected with the work that you're doing in Cleveland. We have a city there that is uh, severely challenged. Its manufacturing base uh, has disappeared. Uh, there's very little opportunity in jobs. The question was, how would you create business, jobs, wealth in low-income neighborhoods that have been historically disinvested in that city? As a result, we brought into the fold many of the largest anchor institutions of the city. When you say anchor institutions, what do you mean? If you look at the great universities and hospitals of Cleveland, Case Western Reserve University, the University Hospitals, Cleveland Clinic, they've all been there well over 100 years, and they're going to be there in 100 years to come. If you're an institution, you have a vested interest in making sure that the neighborhoods around you are healthy, that they're safe, that they're vibrant, parts of the community. So what we've done is appeal to these institutions and say, how can you conduct your business, your procurement, your investment, your spending in a way that could really build opportunity and jobs in low-income neighborhoods that surround your campuses? If you aggregate the purchasing budgets of the three institutions, the two hospitals, the university, it's more than three billion dollars a year. So you've got foundations, you've got anchor institutions. How have you turned that into the Evergreen Cooperative? What we did first is look with the institutions at what do they purchase as a normal part of their business. Hospitals, for instance, they need to clean a lot of bed linen. These institutions all buy food. Um, they buy energy. Uh, they store records. And so we looked for business opportunities and began to build businesses that could be matched to the procurement needs of the anchor institutions. The model is, it's a three-legged stool. One, identify with the anchors what are local purchasing opportunities that could be driven into the community. Second, build a new network of businesses matched specifically to that supply chain need. Let's build a commercial scale laundry that can do that kind of work root it in the community, hire people locally, and organize the corporation as a cooperative so that people are not only getting a living wage and health benefits, but they're building an equity stake in their business. And the third leg of the stool is green, sustainability. Everybody knows we need green businesses. Hospitals and universities all over the country are trying to become greener. You've got foundations, you've got anchor institutions. How have you turned that into the Evergreen Cooperative? We've. Um, hired today about 50 people from the community. But what, what we have in the pipeline, we can see another 150, 200 jobs in the next year and a half or so. We hire people from neighborhoods where the median household income is below $18,500. The unemployment is about 30%, maybe even higher, and the underemployment is maybe another 20%. But the great asset in the community is the people themselves. When we opened the Evergreen Cooperative Laundry, we started with five employees. Now we're up to 25 worker owners. Within 30 days of having opened that facility, with no advertisement on our part, we had received 500 applications for work from local residents. A lot of the folks we've hired have criminal records or other barriers to employment. For them, it's very difficult to find employment. A lot of people won't hire, but we're willing to and in fact embrace that. What people are telling us who are who come in to work for Evergreen, they say this is really a second chance for us. A lot of people that we're hiring from our neighborhoods have never had the opportunity to own something, to build equity in something. Now being in a position where you can grow into ownership, you know, where you can work in a company where when the financial decisions need to be made, it's not being made by somebody else up above you, it's being made by you all and that someone believes in you enough to, to empower you in that accountability, I think can be really life-changing. 
This is the laundry you've been describing. Yes. And you're also doing greenhouse initiative? Yes, we've got uh, two other companies, one that has already opened in addition to Evergreen Cooperative Laundry, which does 10 to 12 million pounds of healthcare bed linen a year, Ohio Cooperative Solar. We're doing very large solar installations of about 100 kilowatts each. Um, we're going to double the amount of installed solar in Ohio in the next two years through this one company. Um, the third company is called Green City Growers, 10 acres of land right in the heart of Cleveland, right in the middle of the city. We're building a five acre under glass hydroponic greenhouse. This greenhouse produces 5 million heads of lettuce a year. It produces 300,000 pounds of basil. It's going to be owned by the people working in it and we're going to sell to the regional food market in Northeast Ohio. Virtually every head of lettuce we consume isn't grown anywhere near Northeast Ohio. It's all brought in by truck from Arizona and California. That's 2,000 miles of carbon transportation to get to Ohio. What we want to do is grow the lettuce right downtown, two miles from where people need it. Sustainability, equity, economic vitality, they all go together, don't they? They absolutely do. We're working in neighborhoods that have been radically disinvested for decades. What we intend to do is stop the disinvestment, stabilize the situation, and then rebuild the economy. We're very committed to helping to build and empower a new generation of leadership. What is worker ownership? Worker ownership is a way to organize companies so that the people working in them really benefit from the productive activity and the earnings in the company. A worker cooperative is not owned by outsiders. Take the Evergreen Cooperative Laundry. It will eventually have 50 employees. All 50 of those will over time become worker owners. That means first that they buy a share of the company. We actually have people purchase a share of the company. They do it through payroll deduction. Each year as a company is profitable, after we pay off our debt and buy new equipment and so forth, there's profit left over. In a worker cooperative, it's divided into what are called capital accounts. Our target is that over an eight year period, an evergreen worker will have an account of $65,000 that is his or her property. When I think of Cleveland, I think of one of America's cities that's mostly black and white without a lot of immigration. It, it really is still the situation. Uh, Cleveland's one of those cities that's been losing a lot of population in the last decade. Cleveland in 1950s peaked as a city. There were 915,000 people in Cleveland, Ohio. Today, with the same footprint of the city, there's about 386,000. By 2050, I believe, the Census Bureau is projecting something like 150 million more Americans living in this country. Um, where are those people going to live? Well, we could build new cities, or we've got a lot of cities like Cleveland that have a built infrastructure for a lot more people. That's an opportunity to bring people back to Cleveland. And unlike some parts of the country, like the Southwest, we have a lot of water in Northeast Ohio. Uh -huh. So it could be a very <laughs> desirable place to live. When you look at the changing demographics, nearly half of the children in this country are children of color. 92% of the growth in this country from 2000 to 2010 came from increases in people of color. And certainly by 2040, we're going to be a nation in which the majority of people are people of color. As I think about the future, it seems that we have a new imperative around equity, a new urgency. In fact, it seems to me that equity is the superior growth model for the future. Do you agree with that? I think that theme should be emblazoned across this country. Um, we have got to get that idea to take hold. We have a situation in this country where so much of economic development has been a trickle-down theory. We've got to have a new model. And the idea that equity is a superior growth model makes an awful lot of sense to me. And I think as a theme that cities, urban areas particularly, all over this country should adopt, I think every mayor should be talking about that, that that's what our economic development policy in our city is committed to. Thank you, Ted. I have really enjoyed this conversation, and I'm so happy that our network gets to hear about the important work that you're doing in Cleveland. Thank you, Angela.